I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The Wrestling Life. A long December and there's reason to believe Maybe this year will be better than the last I can't remember the last thing that you said as you were leaving And the days go by so fast And it's one more day up in the canyon Hey everybody, it's the Wrestling it's Life, it's episode 359, it is our final show of 2023, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. How was your Christmas, bud? Oh, it was uh, it was good. There was uh, there was uh, some some food poisoning on the back end, <laughs> which we we both, I think, suffered. Uh, we don't we don't need to get into graphic detail for the listener. But uh, for the most part, it was a lovely day. Uh, weather was pretty nice. Food was was good on when it was coming in, and uh, and uh, watched just watched uh, watched our Ravens uh, kick some butt on a primetime game. So uh, hard to hard to complain about it. We're here mainly to preview uh, World's End AEW's pay per view this weekend uh, because WWE took the week off mm-hmm. uh, from television except NXT. Um, which was a taped episode, but still uh, first run programming, and uh, I haven't seen it yet. So uh, we're here pretty much to talk about World's End, and uh, we can talk about the house show I went to. Maybe all of that Absolutely. wasn't very, wasn't very exciting. It was the it was the show that ran the same night that WWE ran a show in Madison Square Garden with CM Punk's uh, <laughs> first WWE match since 2014 on it. Yeah. Yeah, one city got CM Punk's first WWE match in a decade and Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes and uh, Baltimore got uh, LA Knight in the main event. Mm. And um, yep, that's about it. <laughs> um, I will say the Pretty Deadly Boys and uh, the Good Brothers had a very fun comedy match. <laughs> um pains me to praise the good brothers. <laughs> really does. But they I had to praise fun- them as businessmen for getting the amount of television time and like memorable good pro wrestling moments they have provided to amount of money made. The ratio is incredibly impressive. You have to tip your cap to them for that. Indy. Indy. Uh, Randy Orton was there. He's really over. Uh, mm-hmm. Randy Orton actually it started as AJ Styles versus Austin Theory, and then uh, uh, the WWE officials turned that into AJ Styles and Randy Orton versus Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. After Waller uh, interfered in uh, the AJ Theory match, uh, Randy was really over. I've seen Randy have house show matches before. <laughs> Um, he wasn't trying very hard. <laughs> um, uh, AJ was trying much harder, um, maybe because he's trying to work off some ring rust. Is AJ in his regular gear or is he still in his sweatpants that he was wearing on, on SmackDown the other night? Uh, he was wearing uh, his black hoodie and black jeans. Okay, so uh, those, his, whatever those bell-bottom pants he's wearing on uh, on SmackDown in his match with Solo the other week. He's he's dressed the way Vince McMahon dressed when he wrestled. <laughs> uh, that wasn't exciting. Uh, Kevin Owens and Solo Sokoa had a street fight um, where Kevin used an inflatable reindeer as a weapon. Uh, that was humorous, but the crowd was just scanning we can't see because they're brawling all over the arena, which, mm-hmm. and in fact, we could not see what they were doing. Um, I feel like the last Maybe not the last house show I went to, but the house show before that, it was shot almost like a TV show. And they had like handheld cameras following the action and showing it on the big screen, even if. uh, uh, Yeah, there was none of that here. There was none (laughs) of that here. (laughs) Thanks, Nick Khan. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Um, I would say Bailey and Bianca Belair worked the hardest of okay. everyone on the show, and uh, Bailey and Io Sky uh, lost to Shotzi and Bianca Belair in a tag team match. Um, Bailey is exactly what you want from a house show wrestler in that they're talking smack to the fans mm. and uh doing yay boo spots and uh you know just generally getting fan interaction going which is what makes house shows fun absolutely and uh I was talking to my wife and I were sitting there and uh when <laughs> Bailey and Bianca got in she was like these two are working at a different level than anyone else we've seen tonight. <laughs> These two are on a different plane than anyone else we've seen tonight. And I was like, yes, they are excellent professional wrestlers, as it turns out. Uh, and they were trying, so that was appreciated. And then LA Knight versus, um, what's his name? Jimmy Uso was the uh, was the main event in a, uh, in a street fight. I think KO and uh, Solo was a last man standing match. So they also had the long, boring 10 counts in that match, too. Um, LA Knight, mega over. People love chanting his, his uh, singing along with his phrases. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the way he sells drives me insane. <laughs> or or the, the way he died rather than selling, I will, I will say, throughout this match uh, drove me insane. Mm-hmm. But uh, he cut a promo afterwards and said, "Hey, uh, I've uh, this, this is my first time in the arena. Actually, it's the first time in the arena as a, as a wrestler. I used to come here as a fan all the time. This is my home arena as a fan. I've come home. I watched Hogan and Vader at Super Brawl in this building. I watched uh, uh, Kevin Nash powerbomb Eric Bischoff off the stage in this building." I used to watch Raw over there. I used to sit over there and watch SmackDown. It's like so. This is very cool. Uh, so I guess that was nice. Hometown boy, as mentioned, or well, Hagerstown is his actual hometown. But uh, yeah, that's that's something. That's that's not. I was going to say listing those names. It is not as dire as I feel like some of those B town WWE holiday tour shows have been in the last couple of years. At least as far as star power goes. Mm, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. Uh it could it could have been worse, I guess. Anyway, it was a fun time. It's hard to have a bad time at a house show. Mm-hmm. And uh uh Fightful reports highest growing highest grossing house show in the history of the city. Um I would estimate five thousand people in the building. I think WrestleTix had like high fives as far as tickets distributed Mm -hmm. so that makes that sounds about right uh but uh because of the ticket pricing uh they made more money on it than any house show they've ever run in the city so good for them another another big win for (laughs) the world wrestling federation and our pal nick Nick Khan wins again. And uh, speaking of uh, the other house, the real house show that night, uh, they sold out Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, they, it was the highest grossing uh, house show in the history of the United States. <laughs> and uh, CM Punk and Dom Mysterio had a match right out in 1987. Oh, it was beautiful. Uh, yeah, there's uh, despite apparently them trying pretty aggressively to clamp down on on fan filming of it, uh, there was uh, some good fan cam of it. Yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful, perfect house show match. He was doing a lot of like looking to the crowd too. Like he was he's been watching not just do it because he started doing the leg drop in AEW. I feel like he's been doing he's been watching a lot of Saturday Night's main event. He's been watching a lot of Hogan. Sure. Of his gestures are very, uh, very, ho- and again, that could also be because he's playing it up for a house show crowd as opposed to how he might work when he's on national television. But, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, it was, a, uh, it felt like a big deal. And, uh, yeah, he's for whatever reason, he's in like plain black tights. Maybe he just doesn't want to, sh- like, maybe he's got new gear coming and he didn't want to reveal it at a house show or whatever. Maybe he had, he has new gear coming and it wasn't ready yet. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to, I guess he didn't want to wear any of his, I don't feel like there's anything AEW proprietary on the gear he wore there, but maybe that just has bad 
bad juju for him, so he didn't want to wear that stuff either. He he had special I'm at MSG gear made, and it wasn't ready in time. I see. We know this because he leaks everything to the media immediately. (laughs) 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 Yeah, he still does. So, yeah, that's cool. Um, AEW. World's End is coming up this this Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we could talk about the TV this week. Um, what did you think of Dynamite this week? Well, stop me if you've heard this before. I uh, thought the wrestling was good. I thought the presentation of the Continental Classic with the the three way, and then more more specifically with the Kingston and Danielson match, and then the post match with uh, with the promo with Moxley and Kingston was really really good. Really, it's simple, but it feels important. And Eddie Kingston is really good at making everything he's a part of feel really important. Um, so I thought that was great, especially for like a go home. Like, what's you know, if these such if such a promo exists in twenty twenty three. Um, like a talk them into the building or talk them into buying the show promo. Like that was the best you got was from, from Eddie and, and Moxley on that show. Um, and then the rest of it, you had the, 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 the Max, the Max Joe devil Gaga. Um, and there was the, the edge and Christian pre-tape brawl and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Riho and Tony got 30 seconds and and uh, and then you had whatever else on the show. Like it, I thought I thought like all the wrestling, I actually thought that Sky Blue and Chris Statlander as a match was probably one of the better women's t- TV matches I've seen on AEW television in a while. But um, uh, at least a straight wrestling match, the street fight that Stat and Willow had a couple of weeks ago was good, too. But um. Yeah, I thought all the wrestling was good. I thought Moxley and Eddie did a great job of actually trying to sell the pay-per-view. And then there was the rest, I guess. So a lot of um, Roderick Strong yelling uh, Mm -hmm. on the show. A lot of uh, uh, the main event uh, Ring of Honor tag team title match uh, was a a big angle. Mm Mm-hmm. Where um turns out Samoa Joe has been in league with the devil mm-hmm. um to uh screw MJF. And uh the devil's masked men have won the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who could possibly care? Who could possibly care about the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championship? Uh, um, I guess if they unmask and it's like the kingdom and Roderick Strong. <laughs> I guess they care about them because they predominantly wrestled on Ring of Honor. But no, there's no reason that a top heel faction should be going after the far, far secondary, really the tertiary tag belts, because you have the trios belts and and the World Tag Team Championships, and then you have the ROH tag belts. So it's like, yeah, there's no reason that a top heel faction should want those belts or care about those belts. But that's what they did. All right. We'll get into this more as we break down the show match by match. Um, on the pre-show, a 20-man battle royale for a future TNT title match. No participants announced yet. So really not a whole lot to uh, to sink your teeth into there. Mm-mm. Hook versus Wheeler Utah for the FTW championship in an FTW rules match. So we're going to have a hardcore match on the pre-show with Hook and Wheeler Yuta. Mm-hmm. Uh, these guys have been in the same spot forever. And uh, Wheeler's uh, pure championship is not on the line. Um, I guess they shoot one more angle on Rampage for this. Um, so there's that. Uh, I guess uh, people are not as excited about Hook as they used to be. I no. think that's fair. I think that's um... fair to say. Do we want to say it's around the time they beat him? <laughs> it well, might have been a little before that, but there is the thing where he was very over when he was beating everybody in two minutes, and then someone decided that wasn't good enough, 
And and look, for the long term, for a guy the size of Hook, you probably do need to teach him how to have actual matches and how to sell. But it has also, because he doesn't do a lot of speaking, uh, which is fine for the character, he doesn't necessarily need to, but it does, I think, put you in a weird spot of how to utilize him on TV. Because so like he's been like this like this past like six months, he won the title back from from Jack Perry in the infamous real glass street fight at all in. And then he was like tag team with RVD and teaming with Orange Cassidy for a while. And now he's doing this thing with Yuda. So it's like he's just kind of been floating for a while now. Yep. Continental Classic Finals, uh, Eddie Kingston against John Moxley. Um Everything about the Continental Classic presentation, the matches, I would say was good to great. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, it's wedged into this wonderful variety show. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a styles clash to say the least. But this is uh, this is this is going to be good. That, that it's a good it's a good it's a good match thing you had on, and it's a match that feels like it has a lot of history attached to it as they hammered home in their go home promo. So the winner, it will become the uh, triple crown champion, which will be the uh, AEW continental championship, the NJPW strong open weight championship and the ring of honor world championship. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I assume Eddie's winning. Yeah. I mean, it'd be weird to do all of this and just beat him at the end, but he is they do keep pointing out how he's like the ultimate underdog, so you and Mox doesn't do a whole lot of jobs, which that's is the, true. Only, the only reason like, you would uh maybe pause there. Yeah, and that, that is the thing. Mox has done Max Mox has actually done like a an unusual amount of jobs lately, I think. So it's probably not in it's definitely not impossible that Mox could could win it here. Um, Julia Hart versus Abaddon for the TBS championship. This is a collision feud. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're trying with Abaddon, and uh, you know, I got no problem with Abaddon, I got no, no problem with uh, giving her a shot here on a uh, in the title match on a B pay per view. Um, at the same time, uh, Chris Statlander's better and way more over, and uh. I should probably still be the TBS champion. So I don't know why we're doing this. Yeah. I mean, people, as we've talked about, people are really into the Julia Hart act. So this will be a chance for her, her to show if she can elevate an act that is less over with, uh, with the live crowd. Um, but we'll see. Uh, time with Tony Storm defending the women's world championship against Riho. We talked, I think, last week about the problems with <laughs> with this match. Uh, Timeless Tony, good comedy gimmick. Hard to have a match with that gimmick. And she's all over every show. And Riho is the greatest underdog baby face they have. And uh, I don't know how you have. I don't know how you make this match work. Yeah, like I like I said, I I just envision it happening similar to the to the sheet of match where it's like 50% an actually really good professional wrestling, hard hitting professional wrestling match and 50% shtick with Luther and hidden plates and, and whatever else and Mariah may getting involved in whatever. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Mariah May's in ring debut coming up uh, next week on dynamite. Mm-hmm. All right. Eight man tag. Ricky Starks, Big Bill, for some reason aligning with the Don Callis family, uh, Kaneske, Takeshita, and Powerhouse Hobbs, to face Sting, Darby Allen, Chris Jericho, and Sammy Guevara. Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara have once again put aside their differences. They're once again aligned. Sammy Guevara has turned babyface for... It's got to be the tenth time. <laughs> He's returned from his paternity leave and from his concussion, and um, he's going to be cutting babyface promos and wrestling like a babyface. And uh, 
yeah, in this eight minute tag team match on pay per view. So, uh, what do you think about all this? Uh, match itself, whatever, you know, Darby, you know, Darby Sting tag matches are pretty much always really fun and good. So, I'm sure this will be a fine, good match. Uh, that angle. That succession of angles. It was eight weeks of angles in one <laughs> segment um, with Don Callis coming out and revealing all of these portraits that he had painted of all of his various family members. Uh, Takeshita, who you may remember, uh, pinned Kenny Omega twice in one week uh, five months ago and then has rarely been featured on this show since. Uh, Will Hobbs, who squashed Chris Jericho like two months ago and has rarely been featured on this show since. And uh, <laughs> Kyle Fletcher, who is the Ring of Honor television champion, uh, uh, apparently. Um, and uh, and then Sammy comes out, and he's mad because Don didn't call him while he was out with his concussion. And then uh, one thing leads to another. They do the big bait down. Jericho comes down to to save Sammy. And it looks like they're going to get triple teamed. And then Sting and Darby come back after they've been off TV for a few weeks. And they uh, run off all the heels. And then uh, all the and then Big Bill and Ricky Starks come out first, I think. And they beat up Jericho and Sammy. And then Darby and Sting come out. It was just a lot. A lot of stuff happening all at once. Um, and the end result is, yes, uh, Sammy Guevara once again is a baby face. Obviously, I'm guessing this wasn't going to happen before Kenny Omega got hurt. But uh, as a result, we are once again being asked to cheer for Sammy Guevara, which is a tall task historically. And uh, I don't I don't uh, particularly care for him and Jericho as a team going after the tag titles, which I assume <laughs> would be what we get spinning out of this pay-per-view. Yeah, so uh, Sammy was really upset that Don put his baby in the painting. Yeah, that was weird. Uh, okay, it's not like it's not like the like he put him in there like hurting the baby. It's like Sammy's like smiling, holding the baby, and Don <laughs> and all the other guys are like standing around him, also smiling. <laughs> it's not like they're like covering up the baby's face or like covering up. I don't know, or like insulting his wife or anything i don't know it was a weird the juxtaposition of why sammy was getting so mad and then that causing the rest of the family to beat him up was <laughs> flimsy at best i would say sure all right uh a few more matches to preview here for world's end uh your guy adam copeland is going to be challenging christian cage in a no DQ match for the TNT championship. Um, a lot of storyline developments over the last couple weeks here in the, in this, in this feud, mm -hmm. um, Shane Wayne, now known as mother Wayne and uh Christian cage, um, are doing sex mm -hmm. on in, in storyline. It's Canon, mm -hmm. but they're doing sex now. And, um, uh, I guess, uh, I think, you were the first person that I heard uh, make the analogy as to who Shane Wayne reminds you of as a performer, but uh, she got some promo time on Collision, and uh, people seem to want to boo her. Yeah, she has that uh, that Vicky Guerrero thing where she has like kind of a negative charisma <laughs> that is that somehow loops back around to a positive as a as a performer. <laughs> Like, sure. like if you watch Vicky Guerrero, especially in the early days before it became entirely shtick, uh, like the excuse me shtick, um, like she could she was getting real like really strong reactions just just talking. And she wasn't a particularly strong public speaker when they gave her that role as the general manager. Yeah. So um, maybe that maybe maybe Mother Wayne will develop a similar uh similarly strong uh, career path as a as a manager and and non-wrestler but uh yeah look we talked about it at the time given the choice between once you decide to have the finish to that match in montreal <laughs> be shana wayne costs adam copeland the match it's probably better that she's just a heel and part of christian's menagerie 
than sure. it is if she was trying to like act as the concerned mother who was looking out for her boy like they had been doing with her for the the few weeks prior that she had been on tv so given sure. the cho- given the choice given that sophie's choice uh i guess this is the better option but uh unfortunately it leads to another adam copeland match so uh that's not great um which would be more uh more painful for you personally the promos if he wins the tnt championship or the promos if he doesn't win the tnt championship well i feel like if he doesn't win they gotta keep feuding and i feel like happy baby face adam copeland with the tnt championship could be at least something different and uh and as opposed to vengeful adam the actor giving soliloquies about his best friend i'm uh, i'm pretty sick of that so i i guess it would be worse if he didn't win the belt i don't know if you uh had to watch it but uh the um press scrum after adam copeland came in he said that he had a list of like uh 12 guys um that he had given tony as people that he wanted to work with and it was like luchasaurus and moxley and danielson and darby and they on and on and on and on and on and uh, he's been feuding with christian for three months mm-hmm. <laughs> weird <laughs> yeah <laughs> Time time goes at a snail's pace in this company, too. Sure does. Speaking of, Swerve Strickland is wrestling Keith Lee on the pay-per-view. <laughs> a what? Few, a match like 15 months in the making. Have I been in a coma? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> like a, like three weeks ago, uh, Keith Lee decided he, he was still mad at Swerve after seemingly not talking about that for eight eight or eight or nine months um once upon a time keith and the swerve were a really good tag team in AEW, and uh then they broke him up and swerve went heel and they did a bit where swerve broke a slinder block over uh keith lee's face and then keith lee came back and he had gray hair for a while yeah and uh he and dustin became a tag team and they beat up trench and the little <laughs> the little fake brock lesnar kid uh that that's where it was hanging around with yeah and then uh both guys just kind of moved on and didn't didn't address each other or or and they never did a singles match so about three weeks ago keith lee decided he was still mad after all and decided he was gonna go after swerve so well we needed something to get swerve on the show since he isn't in the continental classic finals i guess apparently the original idea was uh um, Swerve was going to wrestle the Hangman again. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Hangman's never around. Uh, the Young Bucks are never around. <laughs> right. And uh, the Young Bucks, uh, Dana Massey's leaving the company. She's le- and uh, it, her decision. Mm-hmm. Her choice. Don't put in the newspaper that she got mad. Don't put in the newspaper that Dana Massey got fired or was not going to get renewed. Dana Massey chose to leave AEW of her own volition, mm-hmm. this figurehead job as uh, chief marketing officer or whatever. Uh, she just had enough. It was a bit too much. Mm-hmm. Too much work. Couldn't do it anymore. And, uh, and yeah. Why are the Young Bucks and Hangman Page never at uh, AEW after they just signed long-term contracts? That's a great question for... Everyone, everyone involved. It would be a question I'd be asking uh, Tony Khan. Obviously, you could say right now it's storyline related in that they were both written off of television. Well, the Young Bucks weren't really written off of television. They just threw a hissy fit after they lost to Jericho and Kenny at the last pay-per-view and then disappeared. But yeah, um, and, and Hanger wasn't really written off either. He lost a very violent match. but Well, he got beat up by the Devil Guys like two weeks ago. Oh, he has been around more recently than the Bucks. Yeah, there's that. But currently he is off TV due to that. Um, I, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, If, if I had access to Hangman, uh, he'd be on my television show every week and uh, the Bucks would be on my television show 
more than they are at the very least. So I don't, I, I don't really have a, a good answer as to why. And I think it would be a question maybe in one of the, the pre-show uh, uh, press calls or the post-show press scrums, someone could ask about like, what's the philosophy behind how little uh, the Young Bucks and Hangman Page have been on television in the last uh, six or seven months there. Just probably not going to get a good answer because whoever gets a good answer at one of those scrums, but it would be nice if someone put that question to, uh, to, to the big boss. If you ask him enough times, he's eventually going to have to give some kind of answer. Or they'll turn it into a storyline on TV. Right which is a thing they like to do currently. Like that was the other part of the Sammy Don Callis thing is that Sammy uh, started cutting a promo about how nobody is over in the Don Callis family because Don only cares, only gets himself over, which is true. <laughs> yeah. You probably shouldn't point that out. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Miro is wrestling Andrade El Idolo in a battle of two guys who won't do jobs Miro versus Andrade Just Andrade wife guys who hate doing jobs and Andrade's manager is Miro's wife mm-hmm. look I'm fine with it I don't know what any of this story is about or means or what the psychology behind it but Miro and CJ and Andrade together on television uh very funny i'm i'm just hoping for like a like a john stud bad news brown double count out finish (laughs) well we might have to program one of these guys with hogan on a on a house show loop in a few months so we don't want to beat either guy so we'll we'll just do like a we'll just do a terrible match and then a double count out because nobody wants to job or nobody we don't want to beat either guy that's what i'm hoping for sounds amazing uh cj's back hopefully back after like she got a weird infection in her finger and almost like lost her hand yeah that was wild pictures were pretty gnarly yeah i saw every one of them against my will <laughs> uh the main event mjf versus Samoa Joe. we know mjf is banged up he hasn't really done a real match since the last pay-per-view where he popped his hip out and uh, hurt his shoulder or whatever he did. Um, again, the last pay per view they decided to do an angle uh, on the pre show, telling you that the main event of the pay per view wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anything could happen here. Uh, we could MJF and Joe could do a real match, mm-hmm. which we've seen before, or they could do an angle. I don't know. I don't know. I don't see Samoa Joe as AEW world champion right now, um, but uh, God only knows what they're doing with this. Do you have any read on where this angle is? Are we and the the famous Paul? Are we in the third inning here? Are we in the fifth <laughs> inning? Where are we here? Boy, it's it's at least time to start unmasking some of these minions at the very least, right? If we're not getting the devil mask, I hope so. Like God, let's do something. I'm I'm so long since fed up with the MJF thing. So if you're asking what I would like to see happen, I would like Joe to just choke him out and win the belt because even Joe having the belt for, I don't know, a week, two weeks, and then dropping it to swerve or whoever would be better to get it away from, from the max soap opera stuff. Max sports entertainment. Yeah. It's just not, I, I get it. I get that John Cena is this guy's hero and he wants to do, <laughs> you know, he wants to do the the crusading baby face against all odds in these twisty, turny sports entertainment storylines. But it's just it's just not it's not for me. And it's not what I want out of this show, especially. So, like, at the very least, get the world title away from him, please. <laughs> but do I think that's going to happen? Probably not. <laughs> I think I think some in some way MJF will retain here. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll at least get some sort of development in this devil thing to move it along. Uh 
there's also been an eight-man tag added to this pay-per-view with uh, Claudio Castagnoli, Brian Danielson, Mark Briscoe, and Daniel Garcia facing Brody King, Jay White, Jay Lethal, and Rouge. So the uh, guys who didn't win the Continental Classic, I guess, are uh, now in a in a tag team match on this show. All right now, it's like the G one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, classic losers undercard uh, multi man match. I I don't understand. I I don't understand what it's we're doing. just a way to get a bunch of guys on the show. I wouldn't do it because this show doesn't need to be any longer. But that's. That's it. Sure. Well, it, yeah. All right. So it's a mi- minimum of a minimum of a five hour show. And uh, the pre-show starts at 630. Zero hour starts it's, at 630. Zero hour is an hour and a half long. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No one has thought to change the name of the show yet. It'll be great. And uh, WWF comes back on Monday with uh, a Raw show with uh, Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins and um, Becky Lynch and Nia Jax. Mm -hmm. They're going to wrestle for the first time and Rhea Ripley's going to defend her title against Ivy Nile. And uh, yeah, number one contenders match for the women's tag titles. And uh, yeah, day one. And then SmackDown's loaded up next week with... uh, AJ Styles versus Randy Orton versus LA Knight with the winner facing Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble. So there you go. Yeah, looks they're looks like they're actually hitting the ground running to build to the Rumble this year, as opposed to the last couple of years where it felt like they waited until about 10 days out to start trying. So that's, that's true. something. Yeah. All right. Any uh, anything else you would like to talk about? Uh, not really. Obviously, Wrestle Kingdom will be on the on the fourth of January. We've already, I think, touched on the big matches there with Daniel Okada and Sonata Naito. So, the I think as usual, the the big matches will deliver, and there will be there will be the pageantry. And most importantly, since our, we last recorded, there's a new president in New Japan, and it's it's Hiroshi Tanahashi. That's right. Good the president, vessel, correct. Yeah, he's challenging uh, Zack Sabre Jr. for the TV title in a 15-minute time limit match at Wrestle Kingdom. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't know what to make of that other than um, interesting to see what Okada's going to do here over the next month, mm-hmm. month or two. Uh, I don't know that they're uh, scoring with Okada by put, making Tanahashi his boss, but uh, that would be a way to do it. <laughs> always been a, Always been a little bit of a professional rivalry uh tension there it was a big deal a couple years ago when they started teaming for the first time because there's always just that little two top guys both baby faces both aces this generation the last generation who's better Mm -hmm. fun little thing there and Tanahashi uh, wait too many years to put him over like yeah, that kind of thing. It comes up. Yeah. So that's uh, that's something fun to keep an eye on. I don't. I still think Okada's staying and just going to start taking checks from Tony Khan. Also, <laughs> like I don't think it's a good plan. Um, as far as for the whoever in the United States writes Okada a check, I don't like. Is to- Tony Khan's gonna like gonna write Okada? A giant check and he's gonna work what eight days a year for him <laughs> i mean if we're being generous here i don't understand it but uh i still think it's the most likely scenario yeah i think that's that makes as much sense again maybe it doesn't make sense for AEW, but as far as what will likely happen i think i think there's that i think he could negotiate himself a little bit of a different schedule so he could take more u.s dates but i think i think the idea of him going full time to America under any circumstances to any company is a uh, is a pipe dream, but he's also got impact dates, so he's definitely gonna be working in the U.S. Uh, more in in twenty in twenty twenty four, I guess. Yeah. Sean Spears gone from AEW too, by the way. Oh, uh... well, I'm reports to the Performance Center on Monday. You think? 
seems like a guy. I mean, guy who knows that system, like feels like a guy they'd want in there as a as a coach in the in NXT. They've always been super high on him in that role. He's forty two years old now. Yeah, that probably seems right. And, and maybe maybe he gets uh maybe he gets to be number ten in the Royal Rumble this year. That might that that all sounds pretty likely. Yep. All right. Uh, well, uh, happy new year, everybody! And uh, we have our polls show, where we, uh, the, you, the audience, tells us what were the best things in wrestling in 2023. And uh, Liam steers the ship, but I sit here and go, mm, "Yeah, it's wonderful." <laughs> now, so that show's coming up next week. And uh, until then, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. And we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Happy New Year. For listening, don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Oh, well, how was the rest of your Christmas? Uh, for you, you know, you watched, watched the Ravens. Do a pretty good job of uh, just shutting down that 49ers team. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a great gift. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hadn't, I don't by design. I don't pay attention to a lot of like <laughs> national sports DL. Yes, I, I guess there was a lot of people predicting that the 49ers were going to win and we're going to dismantle the Ravens and and all this and, um. That uh, it was kind of fun to see the opposite happen, um, and like it's not like the 49ers completely and just completely steamroll them, which also made me feel good because it felt like there was a chance for the 49ers to get back into the game, and the defense did a good job of like bending and not breaking, so it made you feel good about them being able to hold leads. Yes, they get them. <laughs> uh, the Ravens have uh led in the final two minutes of all three games they lost this year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so it was nice that they were able to hold on. Uh, I didn't want to jinx them by actually betting on them, <laughs> but I bet a lot of, okay, they will at least be within four points of San Francisco. And so it, it turned a, uh, a very bad betting day into a very good betting day. <laughs> After I also bet on the Chiefs to beat the Raiders. Oof. <laughs> well, to be fair, who could have who could have seen that as like a tough bet to make? Because like, what do the Raiders have to play for? Right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I guess maybe they're playing to try to keep their interim head coach as their head coach next year. Yeah, that seems likely. That seems likely. Uh, Ravens might have to play Joe Flacco in the playoffs. Really funny. <laughs> Hilarious. I mean, yeah, you. W- I wish it was for anyone that wasn't a divisional rival. Sure. But it is a wonderful story that... 38 year old Joseph Robinette Flacco got up off his <laughs> got up off his couch and accidentally became like a, you know just throw just throwing the ball over the field he's got his tight end vintage Joe Flacco off yes cross patterns to the to the tight ends all day dump offs to the wide outs and then like 10 long long bombs a game like Throws the ball 52 times, has 220 yards passing. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. I try to keep on keeping on.